So in early August, ANU celebrated its 77th anniversary. And soon after its establishment, Prime Minister Ben Chifley said, scientific research is a necessity for the maintenance of our standard of living and even for our survival. As Australia's national university, a key element of our national mission is to contribute through research and education to the security of Australia and our wider region. And we're proud to work with Army and Defence more generally in this space. There are several examples of the long-running relationships we have with um, Defence and Army, and one of them is our long-standing cooperation with the Army Research Centre. As part of the Fellows Program, ANU academics work in the Future Land Warfare branch on key challenges facing the Army. This helps our researchers gain a better understanding of the challenges from Army's point of view, and also shows the Army what uh, academic research can contribute in solving some of these challenges. At the moment, we've got two of our researchers working in the Robotic and Autonomous Systems Implementation and Coordination Office, or RICO, uh, Dr. Sam Legg from our Department of Quantum Physics, and Dr. Zina Assad from our School of Engineering. And we're hoping they'll soon be joined by others. Of course, we also have relationships through our National Security College, it has a long history of cooperation with Defence and Army, uh, including through the secondment of Army staff. At the moment, so Lieutenant Colonel James Groves working, is working here on campus to bring his experience and expertise to our research at the NSC Futures Hub. And there are other, many other um, initiatives afoot, including in the area of cybernetics. So this is a great opportunity, I guess, tonight to um, build on this uh, relationship. And I encourage you all, after the event, to do some networking, whether you're from Army or otherwise in Defence, or uh, from ANU, get together, talk about common issues and challenges and see where we can get to. But of course, the main reason tonight we're here is to launch uh, another ANU Army cooperative um, project, uh, and that's an Army Research Centre report on Army forward presence and deterrence, written by Dr Andrew Carr and Professor Stefan Fruling from our Strategic and Defence Studies Centre. Andrew and Stefan um, approach this from a, a really interesting angle that draws on conceptual approaches as well as a range of historical case studies. Some of these um, examples show success, some show failure, but all demonstrate the complexity of using land forces for deterrence in practice. Since deterrence and Army's role therein has been a central question of the recent Defence Strategic Review, we are delighted that Lieutenant General Stewart has agreed to launch this report and to share his views with us today. General, the floor is yours. Um, Professor Tracy Smart, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, can I also add my acknowledgement that we, uh, we meet on Ngunnawal country this evening. Uh, good evening and thank you to Professor Stephen Stefan Pruling um, for the invitation and congratulations to both you and Dr Andrew Carr and indeed the Strategic and Defence Study Centre uh, for the insights that you've provided in this co-written occasional paper, Forward Presence for Deterrence, Implications for the Australian Army. Um, I think this paper and indeed uh, this evening's gathering is a good example of what we can achieve when we work together and the, the powerful and I think uh, perhaps untapped potential um, that there is in terms of uh, the relationship and working together between the academy and practitioners. The subject deterrence I think is, uh, is very timely uh, and I think your contribution um, is a very valuable one because there's much room for thoughtful analysis and debate because the stakes are very high. And I begin by saying that uh, I think deterrence is at least an equal part art as it is science. It's not easily measured um, and to do so or to get close to doing so uh, I would offer that it requires some deep insight into the thinking, the strategic rationale and the motivations of those that we seek to, to, to deter. And ultimately, deterrence is decided by its object. It's worth noting that deterrence can fail, 
and we're presented with a very vivid example of this in Ukraine today. And further, that the nexus between deterrence and the capacity to respond if it does fail is also an area that I'd be particularly interested in uh, in terms of the focus of future work. Understanding deterrence today uh, is, of course, more important than it has been for a while um, because of the strategic circumstances that have been well described. But I think, importantly, uh, this work and an examination of deterrence intersects with two other uh, things that are certainly foremost in my mind. And the first is the balance between war's enduring nature and its changing character. That is, a, a, I think, a struggle for all security professionals and inherent in the idea of balance, uh, of course, is, is, is the fact that you're going to vacillate between one side and the other. And the second is, um, and we often feel um, unique and somehow set upon as generations because the, the times we're living in are so much, dif uh, so much more unique and different and so much uh, more difficult. Um, I would contend that if we just look at Australia's history since Federation, that's not, not the case. Um, but nonetheless, there are some things that are different. And I, I contend, you know, use um, the Canadian president, Justin Trudeau's quote, that the pace of change has never been this fast and yet it will never be this slow again. I think that's the unique challenge for our generation, generations, uh, is, the, is that pace of, of change and the compounding impact that that has uh, and the reduction in time for thinking and indeed for decisions to be made. Key to forward presence is uh, the idea of persistent partnerships and that's what your army is doing every single day. Uh, today there are about 1,112 Australian soldiers uh, working uh, offshore alongside international partners and allies. And in almost every single one of those 36 locations, they are not working um, in a bilateral sense, they're working in a multilateral sense. And there is an absolute thirst for further multilateral participation in a whole range of activities that we have traditionally done in a bilateral sense. So if, if, uh, if, if persistent partnership is a constituent part, a necessary requirement for forward presence, uh, it's, certainly, it's certain that forward presence and persistent partnership are key components when it comes to the achievement of collective security, which of course is a combination of collective will and the collective capacity to deliver on that will. And I think we ought not underestimate the magnitude of that challenge. Um, and as um, the, our authors rightly point out, Australian strategic history can draw on just a handful of examples and they, they lay out um, our naval contribution in the 1950s and 60s to the, uh, the Far East Strategic Reserve, as well as the deployment of, I think, uh, in, in the 1960s, um, our Air Force uh, sabre fighters. I, I would add one, and there are very few army examples, but I'd briefly mention the experiences of the ill-fated army bird forces that contributed to the forward observation line um, in the islands to Australia's north in 1941. But that really, to me, highlights the practical challenge of aligning strategic intent with force structure and posture decisions particularly in relation to forward deployments. Um, it, it's also, I think, a sobering reminder, coming to that, back to that question of balance, about wars in hu uh, enduring human nature and the, the, play, the, the part that fog, friction, chance um, play 
uh, in its execution. So from, from my perspective, today's challenge for Army and for land forces generally is how do we fulfil our obligations to the, what we're now calling the integrated force in Australia, but also that multilateral expression of collective will through collective activity. Uh, and uh, I like to use the term that in terms of signalling unambiguous political intent, then the ultimate expression of national will and resolve is putting our young women and men uh, on the ground and among populations. Uh, perhaps uh, more eloquently put um, by our authors who said that the strategic currency or sorry, the currency of strategic commitment remains lives on the line. Now, obviously, that, that is not unique to the land domain or to armies, but I think you understand the point. Uh, I think it further demonstrates the proposition, the value proposition, and the utility of land forces, uh, which I would summarise by saying persistence, presence, asymmetry, certainly uh, value for money, but also versatility. And by that, what, a, what I mean by that is you can take almost any army formation or unit uh, and it can do almost anything that you require it to do on the spectrum of humanitarian assistance and disaster relief through to combat operations. So I think we have not only the capacity but an obligation um, to contribute in those ways. Some things that resonated for me uh, and, and I think are of great value in this paper uh, are firstly the conceptual framework um, that Andrew and Stefan uh, lay out, the three components there being thin tripwires, thick tripwires and forward defence and also their use of historical examples and the one that really uh, caught my attention was the, the UK's experience in the Falkland Islands in 1982 um, and, and if I might may just quote um, the example of the impressive coherence between structure, posture and operational political logic demonstrated by the UK. Now that coherence uh, only emerged owing to a spectacular failure of the UK to deter the Argentine invasion in April of 1982. But that example, I think, illustrates the, the broader point um, that our authors are making, and that is that the tension between the political and the operational logics that shape decisions concerning the structure and posture of forward deployed forces uh, is a, a difficult and sometimes or often uh, dissonant um, set of um, requirements and certainly outcomes. Uh, another example I'd use and, and to, pro, uh, to quote President Eisenhower following the 1958 Soviet ultimatum to vacate West Berlin, here is another instance in which our political posture requires us to assume military positions that are wholly illogical. Uh, and that's a long way of saying or getting to the point that uh, that's why I think Australia's approach um, articulated in the document National Defence uh, announced in the Strategic Review is a, is a step uh, in the right direction because it takes a whole of government and indeed a whole of nation approach to the security challenges uh, that are presented by uh, a new era of great power competition. Uh, it's also an approach that if well executed may go some way to easing that tension uh, that Stefan and Andrew have um, identified between the political logic and the operational logic of our deterrence actions. So um, thank you very much uh, for your contribution and certainly from the, the partnership that we value um, and, and indeed for your insights. And I was just saying earlier that I think this paper um, serves as a platform or a springboard for some, some other um, 
interesting and difficult topics um, to be further explored. So we look forward to uh, discussing what those options uh, might be and, and certainly a, a call to action to all of you um, to apply your uh, considerable uh, acumen and ability to these sorts of problems which are very much at the heart of our nation's prosperity in the future. Um, thank you very much um, for the invitation and the opportunity to share some thoughts. Um, at, uh, I think I'm the warm-up act for the, for the main event and you'll be very interested to hear from Stefan and Andrew. But thanks very much for having us along. Thanks very much uh, for your comments, uh, General. Um, Stefan, Professor Stefan Fluling will now give us some of uh, his thoughts about uh, his baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's Andrew's baby in many ways more than, than mine. And first of all, why did we write it? Well, it, it seemed to us that we are in a quite demanding time for Australian defence policy with great power conflicts, um, a deterrence, long-range strike, a new role for army in the littoral environment, all coming together in, in quite new and, and I think yet unexplored ways. And in this context, we had the feeling that there has to be more to the way that army contributes to deterrence, and especially in relation to sending troops outside the country, what we're calling forward presence, um, to, de to more to the role that army demonstrates our commitment um, than the current focus on guided missile capabilities, which kind of like dominates so much of our thinking about deterrence and discussion about deterrence today. And the second point was that, on reflection, how little historical experience Australia actually has to draw in in this in this context. I mean, uh, the general already mentioned our, our deployment of Sabres to Ubon, which we think is the last time that we actually send forces forward explicitly to demonstrate a deterrence commitment to an ally. Um, obviously, Army is kind of forward deployed on an ongoing basis, but in many ways there's defense diplomacy, there's capacity building, there's still relationship building, less so deterrence commitments um, that we have in our, in our um, strategic history and, and, and culture almost. So our main aim, and I hope the one that we have achieved, is really to open the aperture of the debate about army and deterrence. It's not a paper that will provide necessarily um, answers, but we hope that we, you find a lot of good questions here to mull over and, and ponder. So there's an element of theorizing from first principles, as you would expect in any kind of like academic work in this paper, and you'll find that most clearly in the way that we define this framework that the general mentioned about thin tripwires, thick tripwires, forward defense postures as different ways, different roles that army can play, uh, or forward presence of army can play in substantiating a deterrence commitment. Um, but as in all good research, we also had a few findings that we didn't really have on our radar as much as they turned out, in, in our view, to be as important as we as, um, um, and, and wanted to draw out. And the first relates to signaling and the way that this doesn't just influence decisions on the structure and posture of the forces that we send, but also what they actually do on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have, I mean, countries from, I mean, Britain, Indonesia, and others conducting cabinet meetings in remote locations in order to imbue those forward presences with a political significance that they otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, you have public parades, you have ministers are attending very elaborate change of commands, kind of like uh, ceremonies, which should be routine, but ultimately um, 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 are, are given political significance and national significance to demonstrate that commitment um, by the way that they're conducted. More concerning perhaps is, I mean, how, that we, we realized how hard it is to achieve a clear coherence in these deployments between political considerations about reassuring allies and nuancing commitment in many ways to different, different um, audiences of, of, of short-term political decisions that ultimately prove pol politically impossible to unwind and even practical challenges of forced generation for for enduring commitments, um, all of which make kind of maintain entering and maintaining forward presence commitments for deterrence signaling a really messy experience. And exactly because they have that political significance of, of demonstrating a national commitment, these are often very, very hard to unwind. And so, I mean, one example is that, I mean, um, the, the 
U.S. Army, U.S. Army Brigade in Berlin in many ways only took shape because Kennedy, in the context of the crisis in 1962, decided to send another battalion as a kind of like signal in their context of that particular crisis. Well, that battalion never left until the end of the Cold War because it was politically impossible uh, to pull them out. Um, so in many ways, um, kind of like in that sense, I hope you read that history not necessarily as interesting anecdotes, and as good political scientists, we shamelessly raid history for good anecdotes um, in this paper, but in many ways also as a kind of caution that when almost every country that we looked at has found reconciling, making these decisions coherent really hard, and it would be, I think, presumptuous to assume that we, once we actually enter into this, would find it any easier to kind of like navigate these challenges and contradictions um, than many other countries. So then in the final part of the paper, we ask how all of this might come together in two hypothetical scenarios. I mean, one, we look at, at Christmas and Cocos Islands. If you decided, if, if government decided um, um, to, to forward base army as a deterrence commitment, um, what might that actually look like in practice? Um, and then we do the same with a, in a hypothetical scenario where we might want to see army forward deploy and support as a deterrence commitment to a regional partner. And we just chose Palawan um, um, in the Philippines, but I mean, you can come up with your own examples and try to kind of like start to think through what are all the unexpected issues that history would suggest we would have to contend with um, if you actually, if government commit, like thought about using land forces and army in that way. In all of doing this, we deliberately stopped short of making clear recommendations. It's not that kind of paper. As I said, I mean, look for questions, not for solutions in this paper. Um, but I hope that that's actually, actually going to be even more useful than if we had to, to take another approach. If there are takeaways, though, I'd probably leave you with two um, um, and broad ones. And the first is for policy. And in general, I mean, once we've kind of like done this work, we are left with a certain sense of caution insofar as if, if, if policy at the moment emphasizes deterrence, it emphasizes forward presence, and it emphasizes self-reliance, that it's probably easier to achieve to any combination of two out of those three than necessarily achieving all three at the same time. Um, the second thing, the th second point is, I think, more for army and the Australian divide <laughs> on army. And, and this is really, I guess, that the main message here that strike isn't everything about deterrence. There's a lot more to deterrence um, than strike. Putting Australian troops directly in harm's way, as the general said, is a powerful political signal of Australia's commitment to regional security, and it binds the nation's honor to respond should they come to harm. So for all the talk about rapid technology, for the, the lack of mobility of, of, of land forces and the humble soldier can actually be a feature, not a bug, if you want to link national commitment to certain territories or, or commitments. And Colin Gray's old adage that soldiers are in a country in a way that sailors and air personnel are not, that does remain relevant even here in Australia. So I'd encourage you all to kind of have a read. F feel free to get in touch with us if you want to discuss and contest what we've written in the paper. Um, but I'd like to conclude with a few thank yous for all those without whom we wouldn't be here tonight. Uh, first, Conor Luz and the, and the Army Research Center for their support to this work, both financially and, a lot, and through a lot of support, advice, comment, and feedback, which really has been invaluable. In particular, the participants to an Army Research Center roundtable on the paper um, and, and, and later reviewers who, um, who allowed us to expose our ideas and provided really immeasurably, imme immensely helpful feedback. To Emily Robertson, who can't be here with us tonight, I think, um, um, for her work at, at, in helping with the research and gathering material, much of which she had to organize her, uh, in between COVID lockdowns of the ANU and ATFA libraries. Um, to Michelle and her team, who have organized this, this event as flawlessly as usual, thank you um, and for all your hard work on this. And finally, for all of you for showing your interest and support uh, for this paper, for the ARC and, and the ANU, and for coming here tonight. So, thank you very much. Thank you.